great god of depression. It's the story of an unlikely collaboration between two great minds, which we discussed recently in the studio. Well, my co-producer, Pagan Kennedy, has been thinking about these kinds of issues for a long, long time, um, as have both of us. We both cover a lot of mental health issues, but we really were looking for a way to tell it in a very narrative way um, as a story about real people and not simply sort of the overall concept of mental illness and depression. Um, so she is good friends with one of the characters in our podcast, Alice Flaherty, who is a neurologist who calls herself the only openly crazy doctor at Mass General. <laughs> um, and this doctor had been the doctor of William Styron, a very famous author who himself sort of changed the conversation about mental illness back 20-some years ago. You heard his name a lot around the issue of depression 20 right, years in, ago or so. Especially in the 1990s. Yeah. Um, so it just seemed like the perfect story to tell a bigger story. Because you have these two really fascinating people. And so, I, full disclosure, I'm in episode three. I'm not going to give away spoilers here. We're just going to talk broadly. But I kept thinking through the first three episodes, you have these brilliant people who are also suffering from mental illness. And it's just so interesting to me how indiscriminate this disease is. Did you did that come up for you at all we were doing this? Right, well, especially with someone like William Styron, who wrote Sophie's Choice, yeah. became a household name after the movie won Meryl Streep um, an Oscar. Um, you know, he was friends with all the most famous people on Martha's Vineyard, and he was miserable. I mean, he was in despair, even when from the outside, it looked like he had an amazing life. Yeah, wife, family, kids, and yeah. he seemed... Fame and yeah. success. And that's something that he talked about in his book, Darkness Visible, which is sort of where that his story, um, as we tell it, sort of begins um, in, the, in the 1990s after he becomes famous for writing this depression memoir. And so he was actually questioned by a member of an audience when he was talking about that memoir. Let's uh, give a listen to a piece of episode three. Do you worry about becoming depressed again? I, I do worry, but, but I, I, it's not a worry that haunts me very much. One of the things that I think destroys people when they suffer clinical depression is the fact that it's the first time it's ever happened to them. And it's so cataclysmically ghastly that, that they're taken unawares. If it were to happen to me again, at least I would know what I'm facing, and that would be an advantage. And so was he right? Well, this, this fear of relapse is a, is a really strong concern for a lot of people who have depression. Um, and sadly, he wasn't really right about having a first depression being sort of inoculating him against a second depression. And that's a lot of what we talk about in our podcast, which was he became known as this icon of recovering from depression. He really gave so many people a lot of hope. He really took it out of the shadows. Huge op-ed in the New York Times where he outed himself as right. depressed. Right, he, he made it okay to at least talk about at a mental time illness. When you did not talk about this publicly, right? Right, and he admitted how horrible it was. Um, and he also um, recovered from it. You know, for 15 years he was great and he was talking about it. But then it came back again. And the guilt and the shame that he felt for being this sort of icon of recovery who then gets a relapse was very heartbreaking. And that's where a lot of our story uh, intersects with, with his past, which is when Alice Flaherty, the doctor who he meets at Mass General, encounters him. He is in the middle of the second depression. And they have to be really creative because um, you know, it's not really fair that he, f to himself, that he feels like he's let down his readers. No, absolutely not. You know, he really didn't, but that's, you know, that's a function of the disease in some regard. And Alice Flaherty, she's suffering from her own uh, form of illness, something called hypergraphia. And you've written uh, and reported a lot about mental illness. Is this something that you had heard of before you did this podcast series? You know, I'd actually been hearing about Alice's story for a few years because Pagan and I have known each other. But before that, the, this compulsion to write and to not be able to stop writing, um, I hadn't heard of that. But it makes sense. It's sort of on the continuum of bipolar disorder. It's a type of manic depression. And it doesn't sound that bad, but it can take over your life. And oh, yeah. for, for some people, it really can be horrible. As we learn in the podcast, you know, sometimes 15, 20 hours a day, she's writing on anything and everything, scraps of paper, herself, uh, anywhere she can think of. 
so do you think that had she not suffered from that, that she and Styron would have been able to work together the way they had? Certainly, she had a lot of empathy for not being able to control everything that happens to your mind. She had an immense amount of curiosity, scientific curiosity, about her own madness, as she would call it. Mm. Um, and so did William Styron. So it was really the two of them being fascinated by how the brain works and trying to get out of madness that helped them be such a, an amazing team together. One of the things that I kept thinking about when Alice was sharing her story in the podcast is she was working as a neurologist throughout suffering with this hypergraphia. And this idea that she would be outed as the crazy doctor, as you say, how did she sort of grapple with wanting to maintain her professional credentials while also struggling with this problem? Well, she's just a super interesting person. I mean, she ended up writing a book about her hypergraphia. So she had already grappled with all of that, you know, with her publisher when she was trying to decide, should I admit to this craziness? But part of her way of being a great doctor is allowing her personal experience to help other people. And she just she just went on faith that people would trust that if she was hired there as a doctor, she knew her job. But she was also admitting that even highly successful people also have mental illness, and they can also um, recover from it, which eventually she did, even from her hypergraphia. For you covering this, did you, what did you learn or uncover about the connection between you know, struggling with a mental illness and creativity, which is that larger question you were looking at? Right. I mean, I wish I could say that I got the answer to that one. Um, you know, mental illness is, can be such a devastating illness that I would never say that it is a, there's a silver lining necessarily. But there is this sense that often creativity and sort of intense feelings and sensations in your mind, you know, can go hand in hand. And it's always a real balance on how do you lead a balanced, happy life, um, but also make use of sort of this tension that maybe is in your mind that then leads to a certain amount of creativity trying to resolve that tension. Mm. What about the nature of, and it's very common with mental illness, and we talk about it a lot, shame and how much people keep in versus how much they share with the public. Right. I mean, it's such a personal thing. I mean, I tend to be an oversharer, and, you know, I see a therapist and I tell everybody about that, and some people feel that you should just keep it, you know, in the family, keep it under wraps. And I just feel the more people are willing to talk about what's going on and the more they're willing to accept mental illness as a disease and not as a character flaw, that's going to help so many people. It's a personal decision, though, of course, whether you want to talk about your own problems or not. Mm. What do you hope that people will take away from the podcast? I mean, I mostly hope that they will see it as a really compelling story about two fascinating, brilliant people. But of course, I also hope they learn a little bit more about how the mind works, how creativity works, um, and just a little bit of the history of madness in America. 